Lower Fort Garry, 18 miles north of Winnipeg. Built in 1831 for Sir George Simpson and his wife Frances. But in the summer of 1969, something unusual appeared to be happening at Fort Garry. Sir George ordered this fort to be erected in the year 1830. This was my drawing room, although the furnishings I observe here are not to my taste. I do approve, however, of the addition of the pianoforte. I used to love to play, but was never able to while George and I lived here. George insisted I'd be happier here than at that rowdy settlement up the river, the upper fort. That was really the center of the fur trade. George was always very busy up there, although what he was always very busy at was never quite clear. Malicious gossips claimed there were a number of little bastards running around who bore an uncommon resemblance to George. Mercy me, what are they doing? Ah, so that's what restoration is. There was a rumor in the spirit world that the historic site service was restoring the old fort. So a number of us uh, ghosts came back to see what it was all about. Among us is Jamie McAllister, a fur trader, and one of the first men to visit George and myself back at the lower fort in 1831. I can still see him now coming up river with his canoe full of furs. of that upper fort that dear George found so intriguing. Personally, I preferred my fort, even though it never did become the center of the fur trade. In fact, for some years, life at the fort was rather idyllically quiet. But the rigorous climate of the prairie proved too much for my delicate constitution. So George and I left the fort, the west, and his roguish past to take up residence in Lachine in Lower Canada. But I was assured the fort remained in tranquility. Fire! Until 1846, that is, when the 6th Regiment of Foot arrived from England to defend the fort against threatened American invasion. And for two years they waited, yet the Americans never came. Tranquility again descended upon the fort with the departure of the regiment in 1848 and the arrival of the Colvilles two years later. It was shortly thereafter that the Archbishop of Rupert's land wrote, The house has been improved with much taste by Governor and Mrs. Colville. 
somewhat misleading report, I should think. I find it quite strange that the historic sites people should wish to restore this building to the coal bills period. It really was much nicer when George and I lived here. Now these selling railings all about the house. and 70 were very exciting years in the Red River settlement. The years of the rebellion and of Louis Riel. But the lower fort never became actively involved. In fact, nothing very exciting ever happened at lower fort Gary. Not even in 1870, which was the year the territory dubbed Manitoba was admitted into confederation. But the uses to which our fort was subjected by that government were far indeed from the intents of dear George. One building was turned into a prison. Later it became a lunatic asylum, which I consider an affront to the air of civility and gentility established by myself. And I suppose Mrs. Colville. And yet it was not without its noteworthy moments. In August of 1871, just outside the main gate, Indian Treaty Number 1 was signed between the Young Dominion of Canada and the Ojibwe and Swampy Cree tribes. occasion with feathered Indians and uniformed soldiers all about. Governor Archibald opened the negotiations with these words. <clears throat> Your great mother, the Queen, wishes to do justice to all her children alike. <laughs> In return for the tract of land that is now southern Manitoba, she gave to each Indian three dollars a year. Treaty money as an annuity and 160 acres of land to each family of five, and to each chief a silver medal, and a new suit of clothes. Another noteworthy moment at Lower Fort Gary was the arrival of more than a hundred strapping young men in 1873, which brought great gaiety to the young ladies of the settlement. You may be sure. Our fort was to be the training ground for the Northwest Mounted Police. But occasionally there was a recruit who was never able, no matter how long he struggled, to meet the high standards demanded by the force. that Sir George was spared seeing the sad decline of his fort as a place of commerce. Of course, there remained a goodly number of trading posts in the north, but for decades virtually nobody came to the lower fort until... In 1913, the company leased our fort to something called the Motor Country Club, and I must say it was all rather grand. They built a lovely little golf course. But it was their truly magnificent flower beds which drew most of the praise. People flocked from miles around just for a glimpse of their captivating beauty. And I suppose that about brings it... Oh my God! George! George! 